Hello and welcome to another episode of Pakistan Army. My name is Zair Yunus and joining me today is my colleague from Islamabad but currently in England, Rishan Salahuddin. If you watched the last episode, um, which was a long conversation on reforming agriculture in Pakistan, you may recall that we spent a bunch of our time talking about climate change, the need for innovations in seed technology, the need for innovations in irrigation and water management, how the Indus River aquifer needs to be managed. All of those things are related to a broader issue, which is the issue of climate change. It's perhaps the most uh, serious threat to humanity uh, it has ever collectively faced in history. And more and more evidence is now available that man-made climate change is a disaster already. So we're going to be talking to Zishan about this topic because something that he covers at the Bad Lab, he's currently the director for the center for regional and global connectivity. The Bad Lab, for those of you who may not know, it's a think tank and advisory services firm that works with businesses, international organizations, and governments to solve their most pressing challenges. Um, and the CRGC, which is what Zishan leads, focuses on foreign policy, governance issues, transnational connectivity, and climate change as well. So Zishan, great to have you on the podcast. Uh, we've been working together for a long time, but I think it's been a while coming that you were on the podcast as well. So excited for this discussion and maybe start uh, by giving a 101 to the audience that, you know, we see the audience others see in headlines, climate change, the devastating floods in 2022 uh, yep. in Pakistan, one third of the country underwater. 30 plus million people affected, you know, lots of tragedy unfolded as a result of that. But set the scene in terms of, you know, from the tactics, sort of the events that we see in the news away from those events, but in the larger scheme of things, what is the climate change risk for Pakistan and how is it manifesting itself right now? Thank you, Zan. I'm very happy to be here. I will, first of all, judge you for wearing an Arsenal shirt. And secondly, I will judge you for bringing me on this podcast after 170 or whatever number of episodes uh, that you finally managed to bring me on here. But very happy to be here. And yes, uh, the context for that is fairly complicated. I mean, we can go over the global, the South Asian or the Pakistani context. Uh, globally, we know we, we know some of the, you know, the big budget items. There's a temperature increase issue going to the 1.5 degree world versus going to the 2.5 degree world, which might actually make life on Earth practically impossible for most of it in, its inhabitants. And that, by the way, is the average rise, not necessarily the overall rise, uh, leading to extreme weather events, the acidific acidification of the, the oceans, uh, sea level rise, biodiversity loss, global health impacts, the economic costs, both in terms of destruction and the rebuilding costs that there may be, and then all of the money that you have to spend on adaptation and then green transition. Um, specifically in South Asia, you know, temperature increase is, of course, a big issue. Uh, uh, monsoon patterns, because uh, we are an agricultural society, we rely on the monsoon patterns and their predictability to be able to really capitalize on our agricultural yields. Um, and climate change is inevitably going to affect monsoon patterns. In fact, in some ways, it already has shifted some of those patterns. Uh, then the glacial retreat, Pakistan, of course, is at the southern tip of what we call the third pole. Uh, the sort of confluence of the Himalayas and the Tibetan plateau um, that very much serves as one of the largest reservoirs of uh, glaciers across the world. Uh, and then, of course, sea level rise. But within Pakistan specifically, we spoke about the 1.5 degree world. But the fact of the matter is, Ozer, that Pakistan actually lies at the very bad end of that average spectrum. Uh, the average temper ri temperature rise in Pakistan is actually close to 2.8 degrees. Uh, we have places in Pakistan like Jacobabad, that is in the news fairly often, where temperatures over the course of the summer on average were above 50 degrees Celsius. That is not livable for, for human beings. Um, then, of course, specifically for Pakistan, there's the water stress issue. Uh, there's issues related with heat waves and droughts, uh, both of which happen over the course of the year, uh, and they are punctuated in the middle by floods. So heat waves happen you know, towards the beginning of the year a little bit. Uh, floods happen in the middle of the year, somewhere between June and September. And towards the end of the year, we face droughts. And this is a predictable cycle now. The severity of the cycle might, you know, vary and change over the course of time. But by and large, this cycle will now remain fairly constant moving forward every year. And of course, the floods. The floods have been a, a, a really strong example of the kind of uh, devastation that climate related events can bring about uh, on a country like Pakistan. Uh, and as you discussed in your previous episodes, the impacts on that are very far reaching and go much beyond the context of just the immediate impacts. I mean, just in terms of if we were to look at the numbers, you already shared some of them, 33 million affected, 
uh, 1.4 million livestock dead, 1,753 Pakistanis dead, 1.4 million acres of uh, you know arable land destroyed over the course of these floods. And that is just the immediate effects. Uh, once we start getting into food security, agricultural impacts, education impacts, impacts on digital uh, infrastructure, on the healthcare system, it's a, it's a never ending story. Um, and then of course the glacial retreat is also going to have a series of effects. So on that note, I mean, look, it, it's a dire picture, right? And so this week, this past week was a reminder for those of us in the United States and people who are watching the videos from around the world, uh, what happened in New York, right? And a couple of inches of rain in like epic fashion in a matter of minutes, if not a couple of hours, um, inundated the subway, inundated roads. It was basically reverse flowing down because the infrastructure in New York City uh, one of the richest cities in the world could not keep up with what came, the deluge that came down. And again, that was a stark reminder to a lot of New Yorkers and people living in the United States um, that, hey, this is here, this is now. It's not a matter of uh, if, it's a matter of when, and when is also now in the present. Um, we, As we talk about that in the United States or the developed world, right, there's a conversation about resilience of cities and climate adaptation and, and sort of building new infrastructure how do you sort of, you know, in the, if you're in the great state of Texas, how do you make the grid more resilient because it can come down during extreme heat events, which is what happened in California and Arizona. We saw this summer that people were encouraged to sort of, you know, uh, downcycle their power consumption because the grid was at a, at a stretch. Um, airports, planes can't fly because of the heat as it gets hotter and hotter during certain times of the year. All of this means that a country like Pakistan, even, or the United States, any country, will require infrastructure investments, which is a huge problem, even pre-climate change problem in the global south, um, which then, of course, is also related to debt inflows, uh, meaning that if you spent a lot of or borrowed a lot of money to spend on infrastructure in the last couple of decades, three decades, thinking that the lifetime of this investment is 50, 60, 70 years, uh, well, climate change can wipe it all away. And oh, by the way, you need more. So help the audience understand this link between the need for capital inflows into global South countries, particularly countries like Pakistan, Bangladesh, India, uh, who are at sort of the receiving end or the worst end of the stick in terms of climate change and sort of the broader dynamics of those capital flows in terms of debt burden, et cetera. And how do you see that evolution taking place in, in the global discourse right now? Just, just that one question? Um, okay. Easy, very so, easy question. <laughs> very easy question. Uh, I mean, New York was just uh, just one example, right? Within the last month, we've seen these floods happen in Libya, in Greece, in Hong Kong, in Guatemala, in South Africa. Uh, we've even seen some of these floods on a much uh, a smaller scale of severity um, uh, in, in, in Pakistan as well. Uh, Pennsylvania has also seen some of these floods. So this is now a global event. This is no longer something that uh, affects the so-called, quote-unquote, global south. I will also do a, a tiny little tangent at this point and just state that human beings in general have a tendency to you know, dichotomize things and really think of term, things in terms of us versus them and the global north versus global south, rich versus poor, east versus best, west. And I think that really takes away some of the nuances of the spectrum along which uh, uh, the vast majority of hum humanity actually lies. But that's a debate for another time. As far as the capital investments are concerned, Pakistan's capital needs as far as climate change are immense. I mean, if you were to look at some of the uh, reports, so for example, the national uh, climate policy that we have, as well as the World Bank's uh, CCDR report that they launched in April of this year. Pakistan's climate financing needs between now and the end of 2030 alone are $348 billion. And this is just for resilience and the transition to green energy. So basically uh, 100%, over 100% of current GDP. 100%, exactly. So the current GDP lies uh, you know, just around the $345 billion mark. Um, I might be slightly off. Uh, but yeah, it lies slightly, the, the, the climate change needs lie slightly above that mark. And given that our combined domestic and uh, uh, external debt is also at $215 billion, uh, and our debt to GDP ratio is at 73%, we are looking at a catastrophic situation for Pakistan as long as far as this climate change needs are concerned. Uh, when do you start looking at all of these things, especially in the context of how uh, to use one of your terms, the global north, for example. So the, really the rich countries or the countries that have more wealth or more resources or more revenue, really, to uh, dedicate towards this problem uh, are viewing climate change. It seems, especially, for example, 
from the speech made by President Joe Biden at the UNGA uh, in September, that they want to mobilize more and more funds to be available to the world banks that they can help finance uh, countries that are struggling with their fragility needs and with their specifically, he used the word, uh, climate change needs, which effectively turns this entire problem into a loan generating mechanism. Some experts have actually even gone so far as to call it a modern form, form of colonialism, because if you were to look at some of the other examples, so the floods in Pakistan last year caused somewhere north of $30 billion. This was both damages and reconstruction costs. Then we went to Geneva on January 8th of this year uh, in, in, in a, an event that was organized by the UN to try and fundraise some of this money. We came back, you know, uh, chest held high, sort of beating ourselves uh, on the chest about how we had secured $8 billion in financing, but that financing predominantly were, was in loans. And the reason that's a problem, uh, Ozed, is because climate change, if for all intents and purposes now, the only thing it's going to do as far as capital investment into Pakistan is concerned is to actually dramatically exacerbate its debt profile. So on one end, climate change is something that exacerbates our debt profile. And on the other end, debt is something that actually also exacerbates climate change. Because the problem on the other side of the spectrum is that when a government is spending close to 90% of its revenue, both taxed and non-taxed, on just interest payments alone, that is going to dramatically affect a sovereign's ability to be able to govern itself. So money that you need to put towards any kind of social protection or, I don't know, health, education, and climate change, is good. that pot is going to get reduced further and further and further. And this is just the tip of the iceberg as far as some of the challenges internally are concerned inside of Pakistan. If I may push you on this, right, this is, again, something, for example, just today before our recording earlier in the day, um, our dear friend and colleague Musharraf and I were having, right, this idea, he wrote an op-ed today as well, and I'll probably link this in the description as well, about the need to raise taxes from the richest Pakistanis, right? And this was a point I heard, not consistently, but in in a few conversations in Washington from the British, from others as well, that look, okay, we understand the case that you made, for example, Zishan, in terms of the global North's responsibility, right? Because one thing I would add on this is climate change, Pakistan is not responsible for climate change. India is not responsible for Pakistan uh, climate change. Um, the United States is, maybe China to an extent is, but it's primarily the West that has been the major emitter of CO2 into the atmosphere because of which this is happening. So it has a duty uh, to do that. And I think that that moral argument sticks at times, but at times you will hear from others as well saying that, okay, fine, 90% of Pakistan's tax or revenues or total revenues are going to interest payments, but Pakistan also needs to tax its very rich properly. The UNDP tells us it's $17.5 billion a year are given to elites in Pakistan as handouts in a country where one in two young women, women under the age of 25, are illiterate. It just makes absolutely no sense to me. And we've had this conversation before as well. So has the climate disaster in Pakistan started a conversation of even, as you said, there, you know, the, the spectrum lies within countries as well. It's not just global north and south. Has that led to a conversation within Pakistan that, hey, look, there is untapped wealth and untaxed and undertaxed sectors in this economy that we need to go after to fund this need of resolving the challenge that is there in front of us, which is climate change. Absolutely. Uh, and I think that this is something that I don't need to explain to you, given that you've covered this particular topic and so many of the episodes on Pakistanomy, that there are particular sectors inside Pakistan that are almost never taxed. And the reason is because the rich park their money in the simplest terms possible. Uh, I would, and, I will, and I will go ahead and actually name those sectors. I mean, agriculture is absolutely one of them. Real estate is another. And one of the conversations that continues happening in this country without really any kind of resolution, the policy recommendations are there, the data is there, the evidence is there, the international pressure is there. But as long as the powers inside of the country, the very elite that run the country, are not willing to give up some of the amenities uh, and some of the benefits that they get from the system that they continue to perpetuate, the system in of itself is not going to change. Um, and while the conversation for that, uh, I think especially in the context of the floods from last year, has dramatically escalated, I don't know if that is going to necessarily result in some kind of a real change. And I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, the Ministry of Climate Change, for example, at the moment, which is run by a caretaker minister, Mr. Esther Irfan, uh, is currently in the process of devising its COP28 strategy. COP28 is just uh, under two months away from now. It starts on November, 20th, uh, November 30th and goes up to December 12th. 
And of course, one of our major points of consideration in that forum is going to be the operationalization of the loss and damage, right? Because so much of the effort in the country goes towards how can we bring dollar bills into the country from external sources? Not necessarily what can we do internally to fix some of our internal issues? For example, tax generation and taxing some of the richest people, uh, entities, organizations, uh, uh, and, and, and firms inside of Pakistan in order to be able to generate that revenue. We have one of the smallest tax net nets in the world. We have some one of the smallest tax collection rates in the world. But despite all of these very well-documented challenges, this is one area that we continue to struggle. And this is, of course, and I'm happy to go through the rest of it, uh, just one of many problems that stand in the way of Pakistan coming up with a very consolidated, concerted, uh, and well-thought-out strategy for combating climate change in the medium to long term. Related, uh, I'll get to some of the other issues that, that are there. I would love your thoughts on what they are and how do we resolve them. But two things that you've also been instrumental, for example, earlier this year, we had Omer Naeem at the Atlantic Council, uh, uh, an undergrad student at the Washington University in St. Louis. He wrote a wonderful report for us on sort of the, the need for involving youth in the Pakistani climate discourse. Right? And you provided some input to him because you follow this topic as well. And thank you for doing that. And I would love for you to share with the audience again, this challenge that we see again in the broader political discourse in Pakistan about sort of majority of the 60% of the country being under 30, but barely any representation in, in terms of the day-to-day -day policy and politics of the of the country. And that Omer's argument, which really struck with me as you researched this topic over the summer, was that, hey, if we're talking about climate change and this two and a half degree average rise or 2.8 degree average rise in the Pakistani context, um, the 82-year-old running Pakistan today or the 75-year-old in charge of whatever department in Pakistan today isn't going to be around when this catastrophe fully materializes, already materializing today, and that there is a need to involve youth in this conversation. What's the state of play when it comes to that from your point of view? And are things changing? And if so, how in terms of involving youth in this conversation? That's that's a great question, Uh And yes, the, the data is actually quite stark. I mean, if you look at uh, the num just the sheer numbers, uh, the median age is 22.8, which means if we were to look at the latest census, which puts us, our population at 241 million, that means 120.5 million of us are below the age of 23, let alone 60% of us being below the age and, of 23. And I'll add to that, just in your point, to make it even starker, the majority of Pakistanis were not born when Pakistan became a nuclear power. Let that sink in, folks. They were not alive. They were not even anybody's womb at that point in time. That's exactly right. Most of Pakistanis were not alive, uh, and uh, a, a good majority of them were actually also not alive when, for example, something like 9-11 happened, because that happened in 2001. Um, that was almost 23 uh, or 22 years ago. The The point here being that if you look at the median age, and then you look at, you know, ages of uh, our major leaders, Nawaz Sharif, 74, Shabazz Sharif, I believe is 72, Imran is 72, uh, Fazlur Rahman, uh, uh, Zardari, all bordering around the age of 70, on average about 71 years old, the disconnect between the political leadership in the country and the military leadership for that matter, even though I would argue the military leadership's gap is actually much less pronounced than that of the political leadership. It's massive. Uh, and the ability to understand what the youth actually needs and what kind of involvement uh, or voice the youth needs in this particular existential crisis. And I would argue was that, that climate change and the economy are the two existential crises for Pakistan, two crises that can actually wipe us out uh, uh, entirely. And the they're basis. both linked. You know, cl the climate change is going to undermine the economy. linked with one another. Uh, there, there's no denying that. Youth, I think, is getting increasingly mobilized. We've seen uh, quite a bit of, and of course, this is more anecdotal than it is uh, factual or, you know, um, uh, based in empirics. Uh, but uh, I'm part of several climate uh, change-related groups in Islamabad, across Pakistan, a, a member of several forums. Uh, and it seems there is an increased push to try and involve the youth as much as possible in some of these conversations. Uh, the Women in Energy Group, for example, is very, very prominent in bringing to fore not just female voices, but very young female voices across Pakistan to try and build some kind of momentum here. The problem, of course, is that the power does not necessarily reside with the youth. So at some point, you do have to involve people uh, of a higher age bracket in order to bring about some of that necessary change because mobilization in the country, especially, and I don't want to get into that particular aspect of things, but the mobilization of youth and people in the country in general, particularly after the events of May 9th this year, 
is at an all-time low. I would even argue at this point, what was that, that the elections that are pending now in January of this year, we would probably see one of the lowest voter turnouts in the history of this country, simply because I think the youth voters, uh, which were predominantly supporting a particular party that has been systematically dismantled and, and you know shoved to the side, uh, are no longer interested in the voting process uh, as much as they were used to. Uh, and on top of that, their disenfranchisement with the system, with the political leadership and with the military leadership in the country is at an all-time high, thereby resulting in them not really wanting to, to participate in some of these forums, uh, which completely uh, uh, goes against uh, the principles that you just outlined uh, and underlines the importance of including these youth voices uh, by any means necessary in some of these very pertinent climate conversations. Yeah, I mean, I, I you know, I think your point on low turnout, I, I agree as well. It's one of those things that I'm watching for is that turnout is, you know, it's either going to be spectacularly low, which is where I have sort of my bet, if I were to bet, uh, or Same. spectacularly high. Uh, for whatever reason that we can't foresee at this point in time, right? At some level, uh, we don't know. And Pakistani politics, you never know what happens. In it the is a country of unpredictability, for sure. So there's going to be volatility. It's going to be one extreme or the other, more likely at this point in time uh, on the lower end, which I think is terrible for Pakistani democracy, Pakistan's youth, Pakistan's future, essentially, because they will they will have to own uh, whatever comes next in this country. Um, another thing I wanted to get your take on, again, as you said, you know, 30 something billion dollars in loss and damages. I vividly recall um, another gentleman, you know, Omar Khan and I were running an open source data model to begin to document that. And we had landed close to 30 billion. Um, and then weeks after we were done, kind of 90 percent done with our model, the prime minister launches a dashboard. It's an epic disaster. He's angry. The clip goes viral. And Amar and I are texting each other, ke, yaar, hum do log, the two of us here and sitting virtually on WhatsApp <laughs> on Google Sheets can create a far better, better model. What's the state of Pakistan doing, right? And that led to some a lot of learning for me as well in the sense about the lack of capacity in some of these areas. For example, you know this, um, the audience may be surprised to know that the uh, NDMA, the Provincial Disaster Management Authority website for Balochistan for a number of weeks was down. There was no way to access the data they had access to for the general public because the website domain had expired apparently and took them weeks to get up. So I had to like contact Quetta journalists to say, Ke, yaar, se tasveer leke? send me a picture of the latest report. But even when you got the report, you realized that, you know, there was this one number I remember still on the number of livestock dead in Balochistan. And the number very early on was half a million. And there was an asterisk next to it and it said it's an early estimate. And that estimate never changed. Nobody ever counted. Nobody ever did anything. Um, and then when I asked around, okay, what happened? Like, why is this just half a million? Why is it in 525,061, right? Like, what's why is this round number? And they said, you know, well, because Pakistan has not had a livestock census since 2006 or seven, um, And we're an agricultural economy. This is a question I asked Kazim last week as well on the, on the Agri podcast. So you follow and you're part of these conversations. What's the state of play on the broader capacity of the state itself, uh, whether it's on the disaster management side, whether it's on the political legislative side, whether it's on the policy side, where do you see the gaps and are there lessons being learned in the wake of the devastation of the 2022 floods? Oh, there's so many ways to answer this question. Uh, I'll start in reverse. Have we learned anything from the 2022 floods? The answer for that, I think, lies in the 2011 floods. When those floods happened, there was a, uh, an individual by the name of General Nadim who led the rescue efforts, who led the operation for, you know, revitalizing uh, some of the communities that had been very hardly hit by that flood. And he put together this very comprehensive report with very well-meaning, uh, well-documented and based in empirical science, uh, you know, recommendations for what the state of Pakistan needed to do, both in terms of institutional capacity and building better resilience uh, across the board to manage these kinds of devastating super floods in the future. Uh, and by my rough estimation, I would say maybe 10 or maybe 15% of those recommendations have actually seen light of day. The vast majority of the work that General Nadim put together uh, has not really been taken up anywhere or hasn't really been followed in any meaningful capacity. Which, if I may interrupt you, is consistent with what um, Dr. Myra Hayad, if I remember correctly, it was her or Dr. Ram Sattar. One of them had said the same thing. She had actually gone through every single recommendation of that report and basically assessed and found out that 
the NDMA had basically ignored every single thing, almost every single thing that was mentioned in that report. Absolutely. And back then in 2011, I mean, I was a full-time journalist. Uh, I, I remember those floods very, very vividly. And the biblical floods that happened last year were very much a stark reminder of the kind of devastation these floods can bring about. And it was almost as if history had repeated itself. I'll give you one small example. There's this very famous case of a hotel that, that is in Savat. This hotel is, you know, the deluge comes uh, and it wipes away the hotel every time there's a flood in the country. And this has happened three or four times uh, at this point in time. But because there's a lack of institutional capacity, because there's lack of implementation in terms of where along the riverbanks you should be building, uh, you know, buildings and hotels and, and these kinds of resorts, uh, that hotel has been rebuilt in practically the same spot every single time. And every single time, including in the floods in 2022, it has been wiped away. And this is uh, very much indicative of how we just don't learn uh, the long-term lessons that we do have. Which, which again, it's it's that's a very interesting point because, and I want to sort of get your take on this as well, right? Because if you had institutional memory being built over time, one would argue that, okay, the code would have been adjusted to not allow that, but let's ignore that even for the time being. One would have assumed that to build a hotel, which is a big investment anybody makes, um, you kind of need financial tools. And part of the financial tools in the toolkit are insurance. And if you are on a floodplain or a place where disaster has struck one too many times before, insurance companies are not going to insure your property, thereby making the project unfeasible and unbankable. This is actually what's starting to happen in California, in parts mm -hmm. of Texas, et cetera, or yes. Delaware where they're not extending in Florida, where they're not in, uh, extending insurance anymore because the company knows, the business knows that this is going to get, keep on happening more and more frequently. So why ensure that? So again, I think that there's a gap here in the financial markets as well and how that those are leveraged in the Pakistani context, right? I think it's actually not just the financial markets. The gap actually also exists in risk management and mitigation because that is actually going to be the first step before you reach the insurance stage, right? If, if there's a matrix that is or some kind of a study that is conducted that calculates what is the actual risk for building a building in a particular area that would be prone to flooding, for example, then that would then lead to the conversation about, okay, well, we can charge you a very high premium as far as insurance is concerned, and maybe we insure you. But if that process repeats itself three times, and that's a whole other debate. And there's other anecdotes as well. I mean, I'm sure, uh, and this is a, 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 this is a, a point that I will very uh, proudly steal from the great uh, uh, Dr. Adil Lejim, he talks about Atabad Lake, right? Atabad Lake actually used to be Atabad Town. Um, and Dr. Adil Najm's Najim, point is that, you know, if there was an enemy that came into Pakistan tomorrow and wiped out an entire village overnight, then the following day, you know, there would be jingoistic and nationalistic songs playing on television. There would be a draft. We would be beating our chest and declaring war against this country. But then climate change comes in and destroys a village overnight. And how do we respond? We are jet skiing. We are paragliding. We are building hotels along the, the embankment. We have just given a license to Pearl Continental Hotels to build their own chain on there. Luxus Hunza is a popular chain that is uh, uh, on the on the lake that costs, uh, from what I've heard, about 75,000 uh, rupees every uh, uh, per night per room. Uh, the point here being, these are indications that the country does not take the climate change crisis seriously. And this links back to the point that you made earlier about absolutely, it is the global north's Again, I don't agree with that term necessarily, but for the purposes of this conversation, yes, it is the global north's fault for what is happening. They are principally responsible for CO2 emissions because their industrialization process required them to do so. Uh, and that has led to the extreme climate-induced events that are happening across the world. But there are things at home that Pakistan also very desperately needs to fix. The two anecdotes that I shared with you, the hotel in Savat and Atabad Lake, are just two of these examples, but there are bigger examples out there. If you'll allow me, for example, uh, our former minister for climate change, Shere Rahman, goes around the world uh, and has promised on multiple forums, because Pakistan under its NDCs, the nationally determined contributions, uh, and as a signatory to the Paris, Paris Agreement, is liable to reduce its emissions. And our climate minister, whoever it may be, has said multiple times that we will reduce our emissions by 50%. The problem, uh, Ozer, is that there is no actual way of implementing this in Pakistan. And the reason for that is because while a Ministry of Climate Change exists at the federal level, no such department exists at the provincial level. What does exist at the provincial level are EPAs, that's Environmental Protection Agencies, they're principally responsible for you know, factory emissions, maybe river pollution, those kinds of things. 
And then, of course, there's the Department of Motor Vehicles. But as Rafi Alam will tell you, uh, the Department of Motor Vehicles really treats the registration of vehicles not as an exercise in reduction of emissions, but really more as an exercise in tax and revenue collection. And then you add to that the fact that only two of the four provinces uh, actually have a climate policy. Uh, the other two do not. And on top of that, the fact that we have, for instance, uh, an EV policy, a national EV policy that we enacted, but right before it went live, that EV policy was edited and, and, and altered to only apply to vehicles that were three wheels and below. And the reason for this, of course, is a very powerful uh, vehicle manufacturing lobby in Pakistan that controls the car market and is very interested in not allowing any kind of EV uh, uh, you know, legislation or, or policy to affect their bottom line. So there's a range of issues internally. It's not just institutional capacity. It's not just, just a knowledge management problem. Uh, it's how we view climate change through our very actions uh, as a sovereign state and also as individuals uh, at the citizen level in order to be able to manage this massive existential crisis. How do you think about then dealing with these some some of these challenges, right? As you were describing this issue at the state level, at the provincial level, I was thinking about sort of, you know, um, what happened in the United States where the state of California decided to go a certain way and because it's so large and so dominant in, as a market in the broader context of the United States and its economy, whatever California does, whether it's related to clean air, emission standards, the mileage on a car, everybody has to follow suit because California is just so dominant, which also then creates a culture of competition among states that we've seen. We've seen similar anecdotes I've read up on sort of in India, where, for example, in terms of attracting investment, Tamil Nadu will do certain things and Karnataka will try to follow and Uttar Pradesh will somehow 10 years later catch up to it. But now it's catching up a bit more. But that competition plays a role. So as you were describing that, maybe I was thinking maybe the answer partly is more administrative units, right? Because it allows you more space as somebody, as an advocate on the policy side, instead of going to four provinces, maybe going to eight, and then maybe you will hit one jackpot that somebody will say, okay, we're going to do things differently and have a yeah. success story that then creates, uh, you know, momentum. But that's just one, right? And it requires constitutional amendments, easier said than done, blah, blah, blah. How do you see it? Like, what, what would you like to be seen uh, as being done in Pakistan, particularly in the context of, OK, elections coming up, we can debate how free, fair, turnout, et cetera. But there's still a chance of a new government coming in. What would you like them to do uh, moving forward in the Pakistani context? The, yeah, I mean, there's always a chance of a new government coming in. We've discussed earlier about how Pakistan uh, foremost is a country of you know unpredictability. As a political analyst in Pakistan, I'm at a point where I refuse to predict anything. Uh, further simply because well, as, um, as, as as my mentor Shuja Nawaz always reminds me we are not in the business of predictions we can give you scenarios and for each scenario what the likely outcome might be and then we see what happens but you at least are aware of the scenarios yeah, probabilities versus prediction right um, I mean a lot of things need to happen uh, the caretaker setup of course is important right now because the caretaker setup is going to be representing Pakistan at COP28 and our strategy for COP28 is going to involve a couple of different things that has that falls outside of the purview or outside of the ambit of whoever might be coming in next following the hopefully in January elections, uh, general elections across Pakistan. Um, first, they're going to be focusing on the loss and damage fund and its operationalization. That, of course, is a very important aspect. Pakistan, as you know, last year, uh, as the at the helm of the G77, was able to actually muster the EU to support its cause, which then led to a series of domino effects and eventually led to the formation of the, uh, first, the recognition of loss and damage, and then the formation of the loss and damage fund. I would argue that given what we have seen with other global climate funds, we're not going to be able to get out of the, the LND fund what we expect to get out of it. Uh, at best, we might be able to get you know, 20, 25, maybe $30 million out of it. And as I've said, uh, just the devastation from the floods alone was north of $30 billion, and our climate change needs between now and 2030 are $348 billion. Uh, so all of those numbers combined, the loss and damage fund is not going to you know, put us on the path to recovery or on the path to resilience and or green transition. So that's the first thing. Uh, and there's a range of other things that we'll also, of course, focus on at COP28. But we're talking about long-term strategy. I think first and foremost, there's this pronounced lack of wide-ranging understanding. People that work within the Ministry of Climate Change might understand some of this. Uh, and might have some idea, but just about nobody else in government does. And this is very evident from the prime minister 
to all other relevant ministries. Uh, climate change, of course, is that I think is, a, is an issue that you simply cannot escape no matter which sector you operate in now. If you work in education, climate change is going to result in learning losses over time. If you work in health, climate change is going to stress the healthcare system and dramatically increase vector-borne diseases and infectious diseases as more climate change-related events happen. If you work in digital, it is going to dramatically affect both your capacity to be able to digitize uh, uh, you know, the country's ecosystem uh, and damage to the digital infrastructure, and it's going to dramatically uh, affect your ability to actually communicate effectively uh, over you know, long, period, long distances and or remote areas. Or if you what's work in the, security, it, yeah, it, I was going to was right? ask, what's the what's the level of understanding, let's say, on the military side? And I ask this question primarily because I, I've lived in the U.S. for a long enough time now, where I've seen sort of the military be at the forefront of the climate change conversation, even when there was it still is broad denial on the Republican side, but more so, it used to be a lot more. And the U.S. military was one of the first that al already said climate change is a big national security threat. At this point in time in Norfolk, Virginia, it's one of the largest ever uh, infrastructure projects related to climate change happening in America right now. It's led by the U.S. Navy because there's a big naval base there. So is, is, is that understanding limited in the military context as well, given its linkages to national security? Or how have you seen that conversation evolve? Uh, I don't know if I have enough information at hand to be able to adequately answer that question. The only thing that I can answer is from everything that we've seen unfold over the last few months, particularly since May 9th, the military is now increasingly involved in all matters related to the economy. And I think the economy actually takes front and center stage. I mean, the formation of the SIFC, the, the multilateral and bilateral engagements uh, that the military is now very much involved in, especially since the caretaker setup has taken over, indicates that they are very keen on fixing the economic uh, existential crisis for Pakistan above and beyond anything else. Whether or not that relates directly to climate change, uh, I'm not actually 100% sure. Okay. This is not uh, not something that I've directly looked at. Okay. Hope is yes, but practical reality and historical context tells me that it's very likely a no. Okay. Uh, and I mean, it, it's, it's, it's also, you know, it, you spoke about uh, how you were trained under the great Shijan of us. So, you know, the, the scenario of probabilities that you conduct. One of the probabilities, for example, is a nightmare scenario in Pakistan where if temperatures rise below, above, you know, around 40 degrees, humidity in the air is around 60%, and the national electrical grid fails, which we've seen fail in the past in Pakistan, and we've also seen it fail in places like, as you mentioned, California, because these systems are not designed to uh, withstand temperatures at this level. Just 48 hours of electrical disruption could result in millions of deaths because the lowest income strata of society that does not have access to uninterrupted power supplies, that does not have access to generators, that live in very impoverished, very sort of, you know, uh, uh, slum-like areas, they will not be able to cool human bodies enough for them to be able to survive just 48 hours. A human body can withstand uh, a lack of hydration for up to six days, but that level of temperature and that level of humidity with the lack of electricity and the ability to cool your body is going to result in deaths within 48 hours. And that which, is, those are which, the by the way, I don't, you, you're, the scenario you're describing, I think you've read it, The Ministry for the Future by Kim Stanley Robinson. 100%, yeah. Yeah, so if people haven't read it, they should read it because that it's a fictional tale, but the science on that is actually on point in that book. And it, the, the whole If I remember plot, correctly, I think the book starts off with one of these events in India. In India, Northern uh, India is the place. People, which is a very realistic yeah. scenario. Yeah. Uh, and, we'll and the great failure is a realistic scenario. Moving forward. Yeah, 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 it will continue yeah. to be the case uh, every summer moving forward. And I wonder how many people in Pakistan are actually aware of the dangers of a national electrical grid failure in the middle of summer. And as you know, our highest energy consumption, uh, unlike Europe, which is winter, uh, for us happens to be in the middle of summer. Um, the second, I think, thing is uh, institutional and technical capacity and, you know, bureaucratic obstructionism. We already spoke about the work that General Nadim did in the, in the floods uh, 11, 12 years ago. Uh, these are, of course, major concerns for international financing. So one of the things that a lot of multilaterals and bilaterals say to Pakistan in their conversations is that, you know, maybe we are willing to give you this money for climate. But the fact of the matter is you don't have provincial departments. You don't have systems and structures in place. You don't have enough understanding and you don't have enough institutional capacity across the board. Again, it might exist at the federal ministry and it might exist both at the bureaucratic and ministerial level. But beyond that, once you actually get into the nitty gritty, once you actually have to implement this 
in communities all the way down to the grassroots level, that institutional capacity and technical capacity does not exist. Um, then what I think one of the biggest challenges is, and I argued this last year as well, if you were to turn on your television screens in September of last year, was that right after the, the floods happened, uh, at the nine, after in, in the 9 p.m. bulletin on each one of our 30 plus national news networks, you would think the floods didn't happen because the conversation was entirely taken over by this third point, and that being the political instability and crisis that has existed in Pakistan since the ouster of Imran Khan last year. I would now argue it subsided since the event of events of May 9th. It's still there, but it's you know sort of beneath the surface, and the tensions are still there. But that is one crisis that threatens to overshadow everything else. And until that political stability comes in, forget climate financing. We will not get any kind of foreign direct investment, be it in the areas of uh, you know, industrialization, be it in digital FDI, or whatever else the case may be, because the international community the, and, and the market confidence is so shaken uh, because of events that are transpiring inside of Pakistan and the instability that has resulted in the last few months that it doesn't make sense for them to come in. Uh, another aspect of this, of course, I think is energy dependence. Uh, Pakistan has to very carefully navigate its way through the fact that while we blame the so-called global north for CO2 emissions, it is extremely uh, likely that we will continue to put out CO2 emissions as our industrialization takes shape, because we can't simply transition to, the, to, to green energy, uh, given the costs that I shared with you earlier, uh, just overnight. It's a very long, drawn-out process, the finance, uh, financing for it simply does not exist. The scale of the problem is so massive that until we actually enter a particular phase in our industrialization process, uh, we're not going to be able to transition to the green energy uh, sites, which effectively means that we are going to continue to rely uh, on you know, traditional methods of energy generation, that being uh, uh, gas and, 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 and coal and, and so on and so forth. And of course, the last thing I would say is there is a significant amount of optimization that could exist uh, across Pakistan. Uh, you know, in Pakistan, a lot of times, the problem isn't whether or not we're throwing enough money at the problem. This is very true in education. It's also true in certain other sectors. The actual problem is that the system itself is not optimizing. So, for example, we are an agrarian society. Even before the floods, Pakistan was important, importing somewhere north of $8 billion worth of agricultural pro product uh, in order to feed its population, right? Now, we at the Bad Lab have actually put together an agritech report. The report argues that if you were to look at the agriculture and the agritech value chain, and just make tiny adjustments along the, you know, the, the, the supply chains uh, and the value chains of, of that particular industry, the net result of that could be north of $8 billion uh, to the national exchequer, which completely offsets the fact that you're importing $8 billion worth of food into the country. Uh, and that, of course, is a necessary uh, element of climate change, simply because climate change will inevitably result in food insecurity as your crops are destroyed, as agricultural yields are reduced. And Pakistan, as you know, uh, and I'm sure this was discussed in the episode last week as well, is a country that suffers from very low uh, crop yield per square acre, uh, one of the lowest in the region, in fact. Uh, and then, of course, uh, you have to talk about uh, the lack of optimization in terms of building permits, infrastructure, uh, building resilience in communities, disaster risk management, and things of that nature. But of course, as I've mentioned before, the nexus between Financing and climate is massive. Without proper financing and without proper, uh, you know, the influx of cash uh, by the state in order to manage some of these issues, it's going to be very difficult for Pakistan to navigate its way out. Yeah, no, I think that the capital problem is obviously extremely important and, and, and a problem that needs resolution, which again is linked to political stability or roadmap for reforms, etc. Because you need, you know, we also in this conversation not get into it. But again, let's be honest, there are dozens and dozens of countries like Pakistan that will need this kind of help. And yeah. the first help will go to those countries that not not just the ones that need it the most, but the ones that both need it and have the capacity and the credibility to to get that inflow in and right. And that, that's a competition that you need to think about it as such. And I think the second very important point I would underline and underscore that you raised because it came up last week as well, was this optimization challenge, right? 40% of Pakistan's food is wasted because of supply chain inefficiencies. Um, we continue to fund subsidized electricity generated by imported energy to pump water out of tube wells, where the Indus aquifer now is like depleting at a rapid clip. Um, instead, we could use that money to provide clean energy and drip irrigation facilities to shift away 
from the old flood irrigation models that are used or line the canals better or do better water management and better sensory data, all of those things, yeah. which are better use of that exact same resource and would give you higher yields and also right size uh, the way in which your farms function and your farmer benefit grows up as a result of that. So, right, you know, small tweaks, as you said, can can solve a lot of the challenges. I think the same thing goes, as you indicated, to the EV policy, which is that part of the climate change issue is not just the temperature rise or the volatility of weather patterns. It's the issues related to air and the quality of air in extreme urban environments because of shifting wind patterns, because of heat waves, you know, in concrete areas, heat is high, higher, et cetera. There's a lot of research on that with tree cover. And if you're just running hot vehicles constantly because your domestic metro bus system is not there or electrification is not there, your cities are going to get much, much worse. And as you said, the Kim Stanley Robinson scenario of the wet bulb temperature is where the cities will be hit the first, not the not the villages. Uh, in Absolutely. That sense. Um, so I think, again, like it sounds daunting to me as a challenge if you just think about it. But then when you go into the nitty gritty as you have, the optimization here and there allows you to build that momentum that can then continue to face that challenge head on in the years to come. It's not just that, was it? It's also a matter of if you do those optimizations, you know, it actually also mitigates some of the challenges you have in terms of financing because yeah. these these little tweaks and these little optimizations don't necessarily need an influx of capital. It just requires you to take a concerted look at the, at the way and the manner in which you are doing things the manner in which certain lobbies and certain interest groups are influencing your decisions and just mitigate those threats. And as yeah. long as you do that, that will go a long way towards, you know, solving Pakistan's problems in terms of, A, we are already one of the most uh, climate uh, uh, stressed countries in the world. The World Food Program now lists Pakistan at number three. I think people very commonly quote Pakistan as being number eight or number seven in the world, but it's actually number three for the food program. Uh, and, the institutional capacity part of it, as you mentioned, the two metrics will be which countries need it the most and which countries have the most capacity. This would go a long way towards demonstrating that capacity. And one other thing that I will add here, uh, Jose, if you'll allow me, is I think there's a desperate need for us to also reshape some of the narratives that we've also been you know, sort of fed over the course of this time. So, for example, we seem to be very married to the idea of the loss and damage fund. Now. There seems to be a certain amount of tunnel visionism or you know, whatever you want to call it, as far as that is associated. But if we were to look at some of the other global funds that have been created, so for example, the GCF, you know, it was supposed to be 100 billion, maybe 12 billion of that has actually been put together, maybe 5 billion of that has actually been given out. And according to that Guardian story that I'm sure has also crossed your deck, some of that money has been used to, you know, uh, uh, fund a chocolate factory, a series of hotels, and I'm not kidding, a coal power plant. So once you put that information together and you look at, you know, the needs that Pakistan have versus what kind of money would go into loss and damage, if at all, because unlike GCF, the loss and damage is something that the vast majority of main global powers very much disagree on. What percentage of that is actually going to be made available to Pakistan and what percentage of that Pakistan is actually going to be able to process? So that's one aspect of it. Another aspect, uh, I think, and that this is a global conversation that we really need to redesign our strategy and redesign our negotiating capability on is everywhere you go in the world, you hear Pakistan saying, we are responsible for less than 0.5% of GHG. We are not responsible for global emissions. We are not a country that has created the problem. And therefore, this is not a conversation that we want to be a part of. And I think that is foolish for two reasons. The first is through the NDCs, as I've mentioned, and being a signatory of the Paris Agreement, uh, we have a responsibility, uh, both to our citizens and to the international community, to reduce emissions. And the second part of that, Uzair, is that the largest conversation in the world is on emissions, right? Emissions and mitigation uh, or, or um, uh, reduction in emissions is the most pertinent conversation that any forum, be it COP28 or other forums that exist across the world, pay attention to. And the first thing that Pakistan is doing at these forums is effectively saying, we're not really a part of this. We're not really into emissions. So this is not really something that you know we consider to be a, a problematic area. And I think that strategy really needs to be revised. The last thing I will say on our strategy, uh, and this is uh, based off of a conversation with Mr. Farooq Khan, who, as you might know, was one of Pakistan's chief negotiators uh, uh, at a lot of these COPs in prior years, is that when we look at the overall structure of how we approach these international events, there's this 
and I get it. You know, we are a debt stressed country. We're a climate change stressed country. There's this need to, you know, always be asking for help. Whereas the fact of the matter is there's a lot of things that Pakistan can actually do and start the conversation with, okay, Pakistan is a responsible member of the international community. And by virtue of that, here are a couple of small things that we can do in order to help the global fight against climate change that we can do locally. A simple example, for example, uh, for instance, would be carbon mapping. Take a few sectors, take real estate, take the banking sector, take the, uh, uh, you know, uh, the motor vehicle sector, and just do carbon mapping of it so that that can lead to carbon pricing. And that could potentially lead to, uh, uh, you know, a carbon market generated inside of Pakistan. Singapore, by the way, which has one of the lowest emissions in the world, is basically a tiny city state, has one of the most robust carbon markets in the world. Why can't Pakistan have it? No, I, I couldn't agree more. And I think your point on sort of the small things and, and the emissions conversation, right, as you were mentioning, I was thinking, well, that's also foolish in the sense that the rich countries will invest and are already investing in mechanisms to reduce emissions, go towards clean mobility, clean electricity generation, et cetera. All of which is also is a leapfrog opportunity, right? It's not just a mitigation thing. It's the technology of the future. So by being that, in those conversations, important. you can be the poster child for a developing country adopting leapfrog technologies and going to the next level very quickly if you were to partake in that discussion. Just to right? take a very quick example, if we were speaking about this in, in just practical terms, if the bulk of the global funding is really going towards you know, the technology that supports the reduction in emissions, and we are also speaking about how one of Pakistan's major needs is the transition to green energy, there's a clear link there. Yeah, yeah. You can actually leverage that to leapfrog and dramatically ex accelerate your progress towards that green transition simply by being a part of that emissions conversation. Yeah, yeah. But the moment you say we're not responsible for it, you're not really a part of the conversation. And, and and that's an economic argument too, because you're a net energy importer and you want to get away from that as well, right? Absolutely. We all talk about how many billions we spend importing LNG and, and petroleum. And I think the other thing that- The largest so, import. Sorry? I said it's our largest import. Exactly. So, you know, I, I think th that's the reason for the emission side. And I think, again, the small things Pakistan can do it's, it's one of the largest countries in the world by population, right? So you have the University of Faisalabad, for example, which has done in the past historic cutting edge agricultural research on seed technology and things like that. Why can't Pakistan position its, its universities at the cutting edge of seed modernization, at the cutting edge of agricultural modernization in the event of climate disaster, which again is very relevant to developing countries which will face the same stress Pakistan has the knowledge base and the institutional infrastructure when it comes to things like that in very specific areas, I would argue, um, that where it punches above its weight in terms of capabilities and, and capacity. And again, the University of Faisalabad is a prime example. I always remind people that the 1121 XSL Basmati premium rice that we love and adore is an, is an example of that, right? Pakistan went from a food scarce and food stress country at its birth to having a surplus of food because of that revolution. And there were institutions domestically that played a key role in that. And we can do the same thing again. So yeah. I, I want to underscore that point. And again, this has been a fascinating and wonderful conversation. And I think we need to have more of these. So thank you for sharing your perspective today. Keep up the great work. And um, I think I think there are opportunities here that we need to keep chipping away of and, and the way it aligns right with food security, national security, economic security and climate change at the very top level, uh, you know, being the umbrella above it all. Um, there's a need to to sort of inculcate people's imagination and make them understand what's happening here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. It was great to be here.